guys this is mr millings and in this video we are going to be learning about some endo versus exothermic processes so before we start talking about endothermic versus exothermic processes we should probably start talking about the system versus the surroundings so let's suppose that we throw a piece of ice out into the street on a hot sunny day and what we want to do is we want to observe what's going to happen to this little ice cube when we throw it out into the street on a hot sunny day well if we're observing this ice cube and what happens to it then this ice cube we can refer to as the system. The system is the part of the universe that we are focusing our attention on. And so since we're focusing our attention on this ice cube, this ice cube is the system. And everything outside of this system is the surroundings, okay? So the part of the universe that is outside of the system is called the surroundings, okay? And so when we start talking about energy transfers, or whether or not a system is absorbing or releasing energy, we can do so in terms of heat either uh, leaving the system or heat coming into the system. And so if we take a look at this example right here where we toss a piece of ice out into the street on a hot sunny day, this little ice cube is going to end up melting. But why is it going to end up melting? Well, it's going to end up melting because the ice cube is going to absorb thermal energy. It's going to absorb thermal energy from the sun, right? So the system is going to absorb thermal energy or heat from the surroundings. Okay, and we'll talk about what type of process that is in a second. But for now, just understand the difference between the system and the surroundings. And in chemistry, most of the time, a chemical reaction is the part of the universe we are focusing our attention on and is therefore the system. And everything outside of the reaction is the surroundings. So if we take a look here, we have uh, two moles of hydrogen gas reacting with one mole of oxygen gas to produce two moles of water molecules. And so when we take a look at this chemical reaction right here, this chemical reaction would be the system. And if we take a look at the amount of heat that is associated with this chemical reaction right here, that is to say the enthalpy or the delta H, delta means change, so the change in heat of this chemical reaction right here, this is telling us that this chemical reaction is going to end up releasing 483.6 kilojoules per every mole of oxygen. So per mole of oxygen, this chemical reaction is going to release 483.6 kilojoules of energy into the surroundings. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about uh, the different types of processes where the system is either absorbing energy from the surroundings or releasing energy into the surroundings. And so it's important right here to take a look that whenever delta H is negative, like we see right here, if delta H is negative or if the enthalpy uh, of a reaction or the heat that is associated with the reaction is negative, then that means that energy is released from the system into the surroundings. So this is telling us right here that this chemical reaction is going to end up releasing 483.6 kilojoules per mole of oxygen. And so if delta H ends up being positive, then that's going to mean that the chemical reaction is going to absorb thermal energy or heat from its surroundings, okay? So this little delta H and the sign of delta H play an important role in our understanding of what happens uh, as far as heat being released or absorbed during a chemical reaction. So let's take a look at two different types of processes. Let's talk about endothermic processes versus exothermic processes and apply those concepts to changes in state of matter. And then I'm going to give you some problems to try on your own. And so let's first start talking about endothermic processes. It says right here that an endothermic process is a process in which the system absorbs thermal energy or heat from its surroundings. And typically, endothermic processes feel cool since they are absorbing all the thermal energy from their surroundings. So if we take a look right here, melting is an example of an endothermic process. In order for these ice cubes to melt, they must absorb some sort of thermal energy or heat from their surroundings. Okay, so melting is an example of an endothermic process. And if we were to graph what an endothermic process might look like, it might look something like this right here. If we take a look right here, we have the reactants in a chemical reaction that are at a low energy state, right? So the reactants here are at a low energy state. 
or have low potential energy, and we notice that the products here have high potential energy. So what must happen to these reactants here in order to go from low potential energy to high potential energy is that these reactants must absorb thermal energy from their surroundings in order to have higher energy on the product side. Okay, so in an endothermic process, once again, the system is absorbing heat or thermal energy from its surroundings. Let's take a look now at exothermic processes. So exothermic processes are the exact opposite. It says right here that an exothermic process is a process in which the system releases thermal energy or heat into the surroundings. And typically, exothermic processes feel warm since they are releasing thermal energy into their surroundings. So let's take a look at the hand warmers that we use during uh, the cold winter months to keep our hands warm. All right, inside these little packets uh, of these hand warmers, right here we have these two substances we have iron and when we tear open that uh, that package we have oxygen from the environment and so these two things right here are going to react with one another to produce iron three oxide and so four moles of iron is going to react with three moles of oxygen gas from the atmosphere to produce two moles of iron three oxide and so when we take a look at this chemical reaction what ends up happening is that the delta H or the enthalpy of this reaction ends up being negative 1644 kilojoules right and so what does this mean well this means that this chemical reaction right here is going to release because the sign of delta H is negative here it's going to release which is an exothermic process 1644 kilojoules and we can use that heat to keep our hands warm during those cold winter months. And so if we take a look at a graph of an exothermic process, it might look something like this. If we take a look right here, we have the reactants that have relatively high potential energy and the products end up with relatively low potential energy. So what must happen to these reactants right here to get them to go from a relatively high potential energy state to a relatively low potential energy state. Well, these reactants here are going to have to release. They're going to have to release energy, right? These guys uh, are going to release energy into the surroundings, right? They're going to release thermal energy into the surroundings. And over here on the product side, we're going to have a lower potential energy state. Okay, so understand that concept that an exothermic process is a process in which the system is releasing thermal energy or heat into the surroundings. Okay, so let's now take a look at, uh, uh, at how endothermic and exothermic processes uh, relate to changes in state of matter. And so if we take a look right here, what we're looking at are changes in state of matter. So let's suppose uh, this little change in state of matter diagram represents H2O or water. And so we have water vapor over here and we have solid ice right here and we have liquid water right here. And so if we take a look right here, we have some water vapor. And what's going to happen to water vapor when we cool it down is that these fast moving water vapor molecules that have a lot of kinetic energy are going to end up slowing down, right? As we cool this gas down, these molecules are going to slow down and when they slow down, they're going to end up releasing energy, right? They're going to release some energy as they cool down and slow down and eventually turn into water. So condensation is going to be an exothermic process. These water vapor, mole uh, the water vapor molecules are going to release energy into the surroundings. So condensation is exothermic. If we take a look right here at freezing, the same thing. In order to go from this liquid wa water state to this ice state right here, these water molecules are going to have to lose even more energy to get them to slow down and come together. And so wa uh, freezing and condensation are exothermic processes along with deposition. This is how snow is made way up in the Earth's atmosphere, right? If we take a look right here, melting, if we throw this ice out into the street on a hot summer day like we just talked about, that ice is going to melt. Well, uh, this ice is going to have to absorb thermal energy from its surrounding. So melting is an example of 
an endothermic process. And if we want to bring this liquid water to a boil and evaporate it back into water vapor, this liquid water is going to have to absorb thermal energy from sur its surroundings. For example, if we have a pot of water and we want to bring it to a boil, we put it on a stove, we turn the heat source on, and that pot of water is going to have to absorb the thermal energy from its surroundings in order to bring it to a boil. So evaporation is also going to be an endothermic process. Sublimation as well is going to be an endothermic process. So understand the relationship between the changes in state of matter and exothermic and endothermic processes. Understand what's happening as far as energy being released or absorbed by the system during these processes. Condensation and freezing and deposition are going to be exothermic, whereas melting, sublimation, and evaporation are going to be endothermic. So let's take a look at a simulation that's going to kind of help us to visualize what's going on on a, uh, a molecular level or on a microscopic level uh, with these changes in state of matter. And so what we have here is a simulation complements of the University of Colorado FET simulations. I recommend that you check out the website. They have a lot of really cool simulations. And so what we can do here is we can start to take a look visually at what's going to happen to these molecules as we start to heat them up and cool them down. So, or in other words, as the system starts to either release energy or absorb thermal energy. And so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at what's happening. Right now what we have is water molecules that are in this container right here, right? And these water molecules right now are at 978K, right? And so we know the boiling point of water is 373K, right? So this is well past the boiling point of water. These uh, water molecules are in the gaseous stage or state, and so they're moving very quickly, right? And so if we take a look, what's going to happen if we start to cool this down, if we start to drop the temperature? We can see that the temperature right here is going to start dropping as we cool this down. And let's take a look at the particle motion of these water molecules. As we start to drop the temperature, we start to notice that these water molecules are moving more and more slowly, right? And so, well, let's bring this back up a little bit. But we can start to see that they're going to move a, a, a lot more slowly than they did before. That is because these water molecules are releasing thermal energy, which is an exothermic process, right? And so if we bring this down cooler and cooler and cooler temperature beyond 373 or below 373K, these water molecules here are going to turn back into liquid. And in order to do so, they're going to have to release more energy all right, which is going to be an exothermic process. And if we keep removing uh, heat from the, uh, the water here and bring it past or below 273K, these water molecules are now going to freeze and turn into ice as they release thermal energy. All right, so understand that concept, okay? Understand that concept that as uh, water molecules in the gaseous stage go from uh, water vapor to liquid, they have to release energy and they end up slowing down as they do so. And then to go to the ice state or the solid state, they're going to release even more energy and just slow down and kind of vibrate back and forth. And if we cool this down even further, these guys should start slowing down more and more as they release more and more uh, thermal energy. And if we get this down to near absolute zero or absolute zero, uh, which is the coldest possible temperature in the universe, these guys should stop completely. Okay, so let's work the process backwards. And so here we have ice at pretty close to absolute zero. They're almost motionless. And once we start to apply some heat to them, what's going to happen? They're absorbing thermal energy from their surrounding. And so they're going to start having more and more kinetic energy. They're going to start moving faster and faster. And they're going to start going from solid to liquid and liquid to gas as they uh, absorb more and more thermal energy from their surroundings. Okay, so understand that's, uh, that's how that works on a microscopic or molecular level. Okay, so once again, I recommend you check these, uh, these simulations out through the University of Colorado on their website. Some really cool stuff. And so what I recommend that you do at this point in the video is go ahead and pause the video and take a look at some of these examples and determine if they are examples of exothermic or uh, endothermic 
processes. Okay, so take a few moments to go through here and make those determinations. And I'm going to give you guys the answers right about now. So how did you do? How did you guys do? Well, if you got these all right, then you have a pretty good understanding of endothermic and exothermic processes and the heat transfers that are taking place between them. If you like what you see, go ahead and click that little bomb in the bottom right hand corner and that's going to subscribe you to my channel and feel free to leave any comments or questions in the comment section down below. And I really hope you guys found this helpful.